Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Hey, everybody, doing our favorite thing right now. Deep dives, Chris Lights out loud here, Miguel. MMA Detective Mike, very excited for this one. We, usually we have people from the past, some older guys, um, veterans, I would say, experienced guys. We have a current UFC middleweight right now. Fantastic. Um, Ian Heinitz, I cannot wait to see this guy. Very interesting. Uh, the guy's a beast comes out trying to knock people's heads off. Um, great wrestler. And I hear he's got some very interesting background. Don't know a lot about him right now, but I can't wait to see it. Mike, Miguel, you guys might know more about it. So I Chris, this day, well, I, I know they matched him tough and that I'm excited to see him. And then I know that the MMA detective has had his, you know, whatever you call that, that the big the thing antennas, is, oh, antennas yeah. or, or the, the looking glass. Or whatever. He's, glass. He's, exactly. That's what I mean. This man has been investigating and I think uh, he's going to uncork some stuff. I don't know, Mike. So, what do you so think? I usually wear a monocle. I like that one. Eye. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. I usually you know. wear a monocle. Just but, in case you run across any diamonds, too. You know, right? you never know. So, <laughs> it happens, Chris. We love going back to the beginning. And a lot of these newer cats, they can't hang with the older guys in terms of stories. You know, exactly. they can't. They can't do it. Can't, this okay. guy puts things in a different stratosphere. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you've never heard of this guy or his story. Is This thing is going to go to the friggin' moon right away guaranteed to the moon it's super interesting there's gonna be a there's gonna be a movie made about this guy's life story for Are sure no absolutely not <laughs> i gotta check this one out all right so secondly chris we got like share subscribe fantastic please, please guys like share subscribe we're starting to grow pretty well but uh we can't do it without you guys because everybody who watches is like man that's some good content but how are they gonna know without your help come on people be nice help people out that's it you know we're not trying to panhandle Hit that button. Yeah, and so, nothing feels better than when you hit like and subscribe to do it while taking a sip of lights out whiskey. We might as well go all <laughs> Lights out bourbon. The bourbon. bourbon. You and go. you bourbon. get that bourbon. order from Con's Liquor. I can't wait. Oh, my God. How could I mess right. that up? <laughs> so, December 3rd and 4th, I am in Minnesota uh, with Ignite FC doing color commentary. December 8th, December 17th here in Chicago, Ignite FC at 115 Bourbon Street. February 5th, I'm in Tampa, Florida for a grappling tournament, World Class Grappling. Please register on Smooth Comp. Those are my plugs, Chris. Fantastic. I got too many to think about. So I got my bare knuckle <laughs> stuff going on. Beach. We got a little bit of everything. So, and so without further ado, we're going to hit you with Ian Heinich. Welcome back, everybody. Our favorite time here, Deep Dives. We got a very interesting story today. Obviously, you see Mike, Miguel, uh, but we have... Very interesting person to talk to today, Ian. Um, man, really looked into your story and uh, love it. Love what we got going on here. So, uh, Mike, Miguel, go ahead and uh, do what you do. But I, I'm very interested in doing this. So, Ian, you started, I mean, you, you grew up in Colorado. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Yep. Okay. So, how did you do in wrestling in Colorado You're in through high school? Uh, yeah, I did very good. You know, I, I really enjoyed wrestling. Um I was a, a two-time state champ, would have been a three-timer, um, but got expelled my senior year. Uh, my freshman year, I was 152, which put me in a bracket with a ton of seniors. Uh, Matt Neeson was in my bracket. He was a three-timer. His brother was a four-timer. Um, I beat him at regionals um, by like six points and state finals, um, went in there and just kind of let the nerves get to me of walking into Pepsi Center and uh, wrestling in a big um, – a big venue and just uh, kind of let the nerves get to me lost by like a point or something mm -hmm. and then pin my way through state the next two years um, took uh, all American at Fargo a few times and uh, took fourth at senior nationals. Good. I, I, I mean, uh, geez, that, that's difficult. Your freshman year, you were 152. I mean, usually when you get guys who make it very far as a state, it's like 106, 103, yeah. the little guys. Mm -hmm. so like, I mean, like, Man, it's tough when you're a bigger weight class as a freshman. You're going against men, you know what I mean? So is that you think yep. that was a problem for you, or was it just the mental game? Um, I, I mean, 
I beat everyone, including Matt Neeson, the guy who beat me in the state finals. So um, I had the ability. It was just kind of uh, my first exposure to kind of, you know, it was his brother was a four timer, went to um, Air Force Academy. Um, and just I kind of just let the, the nerves get to me a little bit. I think I think I well, I know I had the ability to beat him. I almost teched him the week before and, uh, and kind of just came out of nowhere and splatled him and just kind of all kind of embarrassed him. And uh, him and his brother had like a big reputation. So, um, you know, I, yeah, I just, I just let the hype get to me and uh, the big, the big first time in like a, a big uh, venue, big stage. And yeah, but I learned from it. And the next year, I mean, I pinned my way through state and I was actually uh, the only, the only one of only two to, to take second at Ironman, um, which was in Ohio out of Colorado. So most guys from Colorado don't even place at that tournament as well. Wow. Let me, can I jump yeah. in here? Yeah. For yeah. the folks at home and for everybody, this is Ian Heinich. These heathens didn't even properly introduce you with a full name. So uh, Ian and uh, Ian Heinich is an active UFC middleweight, kind of makes it a little different for us here because he's currently competing and active. And as Mike said, we're going to go through the early part of his career. But I just want to get that little data in there because you both called him Ian. And didn't get the full name in there. And I was like, okay. well, I just want to make sure I'm pronouncing it right, too. Is that correct, Ian? That Heinish? is correct. Ian Heinish. Yep. The okay. hurricane. Well, thanks for pointing out sure. our shortcomings, Miguel. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Miguel. Appreciate it, man. Just, please, please ship in whatever. All right. So you, you get expelled your senior year. Does that have to do with the kind of wild and crazy activity that takes place later? Uh, yeah. I mean, there was just, just a spirit uh, inside of me that was just wild. And, like, I just... You know, honestly, too, I was really uh, consumed with uh, an addictive, uh, basically, my whole family on my dad's side was in and out of rehab. And so I was kind of plagued with this addiction. Um, and by the age of 13 or 14, I was like super hyper in class and getting in a ton of trouble even before I started partying. And uh, parents took me to the doctor, got prescribed a big uh, prescription to Adderall at a young age. So uh, that kind of started the um, the drugs. And from there, we graduated smoking weed, drinking cocaine and stuff like that. Still competed at a super high level, still would win. Um, I actually one time fell asleep behind the wheel, missed a sign in a, in a tree by inches. Um, and next day went to a tournament completely wasted after that and won the tournament. And honestly, my parents were kind of sad that I won that because it kind of enabled me to continue with my lifestyle. Cause I was like, I could still win. Okay, yeah. so when you, uh, you, know, you had talked about, you know, addictive personalities and stuff like that. So you were very advanced at wrestling at a, I mean, obviously at an early age. Do you think that was part of your addiction as well? Is that why you were so good at it? Yeah, absolutely. Because I only started wrestling at age 11. And for people that wrestle, uh, know that's that old. that's kind of, that's old. Yeah, so, but I, my first year of wrestling, I didn't place at a single tournament. And then I remember I was like, dad, I don't even want to do anything this summer except wrestle. And I went from like, I think I went to like four wrestling camps that summer, like New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, wow. and wrestling camp to wrestling camp, came back to next year in one state. So yeah, definitely. <laughs> I was, I'm, I'm all or nothing on everything I do. So I got to make sure I'm doing the right stuff where it can be a real path of destruction. So would you mind talking like your senior year, I'm assuming, is that when you, the arrests took place? What's that? Um, no, actually. So my senior year, um, I was just a habitual offender. You know, it wasn't one thing in particular. It was ditching school. It was being high at school. It was like fighting, um, skipping class, just everything about it. And I was a habitual offender. Finally, they just let me go. They were like, you're expelled. We just can't do anything. My wrestling coach was super dis uh, disappointed. And I went back home and uh, I just kind of partied that whole year. And uh, I had a girlfriend at the time. She was... Um, she, her, her family was pretty loaded and she was like I believe in you babe I was like I want to go to senior nationals it's kind of like the Super Bowl of your high school career you have to be a state champ to even be eligible to go um, she kind of funded the whole trip we went out to Virginia Beach me and her she was like 16 I was 18 we went out there I ended up partying the night before and then was like felt super convicted about it and, and just made weight somehow and went out there uh, lost to the guy who won it by one point, wrestled eight matches back to take fourth, and um, got offered a full-ride scholarship to um, all different universities. But obviously getting expelled, you can only get get into a JUCO. 
um, went to Northern Idaho and um, stayed up there for, you know, three to four months and just another opportunity I blew. I had a full ride scholarship plus books, housing, and uh, a little bit of money in the bank and just blew everything, was just drinking, partying, uh, not making time to go to school at all. And uh, about that time, my parents got divorced. Uh, my, it was 2008. They tried to sell their house. The Two years previous to this, they took out a half a million dollar loan. Um, they did an a, addition to their house. They made it their dream house. Um, they couldn't even sell the house for 400000 because the market crashed. The house is worth one point one point two million now, and so they lost everything they they ever had, and so I just kind of went back home and was back home and was kind of used to having things, had a pretty good childhood, but came back home and it was during a recession. Everyone was broke, and I was like, "Man, I need to um, make some money." So um, one thing I did is a, a girl I used to date was living in Canada. She flew me out to Canada to go to prom with her. Uh, found a job doing door-to-door sales, making two to four thousand dollars a week. Um, good money for a nineteen-year-old. Serious money, and and yeah. learning just a lot. I mean, you're you're a savage if you can do door-to-door sales and be really successful at it. For sure. And um, so I ended up doing this. And long story short, uh, left that girl that I was dating. Um, met this thirty-seven-year-old girl when I was nineteen. Knocked on her door. Um, opened the door. She was with three of her friends. They were all drinking and she's like, oh, he's hot. They brought me in. She was like crying in the corner. They were like, she just broke up with her boyfriend. You need to uh, make her happy. And so I started dancing with her, drinking towards the end of the night. I signed them all up for my contracts too. I got all the sales. And then um, and towards Who the end of the night, they're like, yeah, exactly. I took care of business first. And then um, all, at the end of the night, her, her friends are like, she's too drunk to drive. You got to take her home. I dropped off the contracts to my, You're my just sales doing manager. Sales? Yeah. What's that? You're yeah, just doing sales. Door. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you got to drive her home. She's your responsibility. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. I know. They were like, they're like, you're the only soberish one here. You have to drive her home. And I was like, all right, whatever. Get yeah, handed off the contracts that I signed up to my, my sales manager. And we're always supposed to have a meeting. And I remember I just slapped them on her lap. I was like, I got to go. And she's like, what? you need to come back with us. And I was like, I got to go file those contracts for me. And I remember, I remember like jogging away as she's screaming at me. Yeah. And uh, anyways, got in the car with this chick. I drove her to her house. We're sitting there drinking a bottle of wine. She sold wine for a living. So she had really nice wine. And uh, all of a sudden I heard boom, 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 like the police. And I was like, huh. And uh, I see her run to the door all nervous looking. And she lived in like a duplex, but she lived upstairs. So her front door was actually a sliding glass door. And she opened the curtains and it was her ex-husband because she wasn't answering. And um, he's pounding on the door and he's like, let me in. I'm going to kill you, blah, blah, blah. And and she's got her two kids in there too. And uh, and then he sees me and he gets real hyped. And so he's like, what? And he's like, get out here. And I was like, I walked to the door. I was like, you want me to come out there? He's like, yeah. And so I like unlatched the sliding glass door. I opened it just enough for my fist to go through. Boom. Right in the nose. Uh, Dropped him. Jumped full mount. Just giving him slaps. Like, hey, man, you're going to go home, right? Like, your two kids are sleeping inside. I'm not going to beat you up right here. And uh, I remember he grabbed me in the balls and twisted. And I just snapped. And I like grabbed him by his shirt, lifted him up, held him over this two-story balcony. And he's like, no. And I heard her scream, no. And so I threw him. (laughs) I grabbed him by his shirt and by his pant leg and rolled him down a flight of stairs. And uh, he, he, he left. Uh, I ended up moving in with this chick 10 days later. And um, <laughs> sounds healthy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a good but, first date. I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's Memorable story. <laughs> uh, move, fast forward like six months, man. I'm living with this chick. I bought a car, making good money. Um, it's like eight in the morning. I hear boom, 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 pounding on the door again. And I'm like, oh man, round two, you know, I think he's back for more. I go, I open the door. This dude's been like stalking me, doing research on me. He found out I'm American. I'm illegally working in Canada. Immigration police, boom. I'm in my underwear. They slap the cuffs on me. I remember it was Thursday night. Friday was a holiday. And Brock Lesnar was fighting Cain Velasquez on Saturday. And, uh, and I had to sit in the holding cell for four days and I was losing my mind. And back then I was using like Xanax and drinking. I was having withdrawals. Oh, you're going through withdrawal. Oh, so I'm freaking out in the cell. I make them take me to the hospital and give me more Xanax. And um, 
finally Monday comes around. This chick shows up. There's no bail bondsman in Canada. She posts five thousand dollars cash, bails me out, and um, you know I'm super sad, man. I'm like, man, you know I had a really good life here. I know they're gonna deport me. This is not gonna work out. And um, long story short, man, she took me home. My the ecstasy I had hidden was gone. She heard that I hooked up with the chick I, I originally went out there with. So she told me she ate that ecstasy with the ex-husband's friend and they hooked up all weekend. Long story short, I smashed the house up. Um, I was drinking tequila. I kind of put her on the wall, soprano style, punched a hole in the wall next to her head. And uh, she woke up the next morning, saw her house was trash, took her kids to school. She was, they were really scared. She came home, jumped on me full mount, was pounding on me. And I remember I just wanted whatever was happening to stop. And uh, so I like woke up and I like threw her down and she was just like, you're crazy. And uh, she called the police. I grabbed like her $2,000 bottle of wine, took off running towards the beach. The cops swerved in front of me. I rolled over their cop car hood and uh, the bottle broke. And I apparently lunged at them. I don't really remember because I was so barred out on Xanax and drinking from the night before. And man, they put me in the back of that cop car and whooped my ass, man. I remember you Americans and they kicked me in the ribs. I showed up to court with a swollen black eye. And uh, I remember my lawyer was like, he was like, don't say anything. And right when he said that, I just stood up. I was like, your honor, I would like to speak. And I was like, oh. still, still completely gone. And I was like, your honor, I'm not a dangerous person. I just get belligerent when I drink and do Xanax. And this made front page of the newspaper in the Vancouver Sun. Like, um, and and uh, the, the, the judge basically was like, Ian, you are a threat to Canadian society. We will not allow you to walk free man on our streets anymore. Um, we sentence you to jail until you are deported from this country. And I'll never forget, I'm walking out in her, in her stupid Canadian accent. She was like, Ian, I'm so sorry. And uh, that, was, <laughs> that was one of the last times I saw her. She actually flew out. We're, we're actually really cool now. We're like friends and stuff. But uh, yeah, I, st I, I went to jail for the first time for six months got deported back to Colorado and came yeah, back. See, to you. When they Go deport ahead. people, it is not a fast process. It Why takes, wasn't it two weeks? I don't it understand. takes months. Get him out. No, Chris, Why it takes months. 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 But they gotta, One I mean, second, they're guys. so stupid. They're paying for him. It costs Chris, them money. Why do they not just you, say, they, get out? You Chris, I mean? it takes, it, even here, it takes, it, even if it's just a habitual violent offender that... See? got convicted did their time it takes months to get them from the deportation facility yeah you see once once i take over the country and get this like once my <laughs> yeah. 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 streamline guys like this is gonna, take, this gonna take two weeks to get people out that's that's my oath two weeks you're out probably the next day i'm getting you so out here. so i just i did a little research you, you mentioned lesnar velasquez so this is around the end of 2010 just for some time a time frame for some people and uh, so where, where's the MMA training in your life at this point? <laughs> yeah, I mean, are you following the sport? Are you a big fan I mean, of Vancouver's a pretty I, – I, I know Vancouver pretty well. Vancouver's got a pretty good scene, you know, a lot it of can. It does Kang out there. Yeah. So, um, so, I mean, at this time, man, uh, you know, obviously my wrestling career is kind of over. Um, <laughs> and I, I just, I just kind of like lifted weights a lot. I was just kind of a meathead, just bodybuilding type lifting. And, um, uh, honestly, like I, it was like, God put something on my heart, man. Like, man, you're going to, you're going to be a fighter. Like even in college, every night we're drinking, we're watching Mike Tyson's greatest knockouts. We're watching Fedor, like on the YouTube, just like pride. Um, you know, we're watching the beginning of UFC and, um, it, man, I was just like, you even see if you Google the newspaper, you can Google the newspaper. I made up this crazy story that I'm a cage fighter. And because um, they questioned me when I was just completely bl uh, um, just blitzed. And, uh, yeah. yeah. And so they were like, I was like, I'm a UFC fighter. I met my girl on or I, I didn't say I was a UFC fighter. I was like, said, I'm a professional cage fighter. And I met my girl on the Internet because I didn't want to put the company on blast that I was doing door to door sales with because they were paying me under the table. And um, I made up this crazy story, man. And um, so, yeah, there wasn't I, I did a few MMA classes. It was it was not really 
um, in my life yet. It, it wasn't there. I get back to Denver, Colorado. I'm broke. I'm back in the same situation. I met some Guatemalans out there that were, we started sending some ecstasy back to Colorado and we were making some decent money. And I was like, man, they could just send me some. And this is kind of when the rave scene started being a real big thing. And so they started sending me shipments. Uh, wait, you know, wait, 2000. Did you speak Spanish at this time? No. Okay, perfect. All right, because I know you speak Spanish now. All right, so continue. Yes. Go ahead. Um, so they they start sending me shipments, 2,000 pills a week. I mean, we're hitting the rave scene. We're just selling. Um, you know, we're, we're finding some consistent buyers, and um, we're starting a Western Union of money every week, every week, sending them a bunch of money. Wait, wait, so, so, wait, wait, hold up. So Western Union is the largest money launderer in the entire world. They're based out of Panama. Rather than doing small increments of payments, it's better off sending one large payment. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, Western Union was not on our side at all. And it, kind of a funny story if you're into crypto. So we were sending all this money and I was sending like $2,000 and I was paying different girls like, hey, send this money for me. Here's 50 bucks, you know, send this money for me. And uh, so West Union started freezing my accounts, like even though it wasn't our name, just from the locations I was at, they started like freezing it. And it was really hard to get the money back. I was like, man, this isn't working. So I call my guy. I'm like, dude, they're giving me such a hard time. It's so annoying. Like, what are we going to do? And he's like, he's like, go buy this thing called Bitcoin. That's fine. And, uh, and you could send it to me. And, it, and I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, it's like a stock. It'll go up. It'll go down a little bit. But you can like send it to me. And I was like, what? And I looked online and it was 17 cents of Bitcoin. And I was uh -uh. like, yeah. And I was like, and I was like, I was like, I don't understand it, man. This is, this isn't going to work. So he goes, okay, I'm going to send someone down there um, with a hundred thousand pills. And uh, you're just going to pay this guy. He's going to post up in a hotel and he's just going to wait till you sell all the pills and you're just going to pay him directly. And I was like, okay, cool. So um, that's what we started doing. I started getting 10,000 pills a week giving this guy the cash. And um, eventually we got set up in a Walmart parking lot. Some chick, my partner was kind of dating. It was kind of weird. She continued to ask me, Hey, can we get a thousand pills? And I'm like, what? I don't know. You're like, I didn't never told her, but she wasn't dumb. Like there was money and drugs around and we just never worked. And uh, I think it was like the third time she asked me, she's like, Hey, um, I'll drive and he's going to pay you 6,000 for a thousand. And I was like, and I was like, hmm, that's pretty good. I was like, you'll drive? So I sat directly behind her in her car and I put the pills right uh, by my feet. And I remember I was like, if I get pulled over, I'm pushing this right under her seat. And so we went and we went in this Walmart parking lot in Thornton, Colorado. And uh, this, this Mexican dude gets in and he's just looking a little sketchy to me, kind of shaky. And then I see him starting to count the money. I'm like, there's not enough money there. I can just tell it's not enough money. And so I'm like, all right, go drive through the McDonald's drive through and so she pulls out and starts driving and uh, we get smashed from the front, smashed from the back from like a Tahoe or something. And they jumped out pistols. Boom. I just remember like pistol to my temple face on the blacktop, looking at the broken Walmart sign. And I was like, Man, I really messed up. And uh, so went to jail. That? That, that was the cops. Yeah. But who ran? Yeah. That was, that was drug task force. I don't know. I think it was the girl. But apparently she did a bunch of time, too. So it was definitely the guy who got in the car was definitely working for the cops. That yeah. was for sure. But well, whoever, whoever you met him through was probably the person that set that up. That's And that was that girl. But I don't know. But she ended up doing a bunch of time. I don't know. I but think she, she could probably been, said. Ian, she could have been doing time for something else. And this could have yeah, lessened and, the time. And, yeah, yeah, I agree. No, yeah, for sure. It was her. She, she, she made the call. So I blame her. But anyways, I posted, I posted bail. I was like, uh, you know, there's no way I'm going to prison for four to six years. I'm 19 years old. Is it federal? Is this federal? Mm, they, yeah. they were mailing stuff back and forth. Okay. So it was, did it, was this the, I mean, did the feds come get you or was this like the local? No, it, it was a, it was a drug task force of Denver. So it wasn't like, federal. I don't, yeah, it, I just know I posted bail. I went back to my dad, my grandma's apartment where we were selling out of which she lived in New York and she, uh, my grandfather died and she would never travel back. So my dad was kind of living in this condo 
we went back there, man. The police like tore it up like the movies, man. Cut the bed open, oh. um, found everything, stole like 30 grand cash, stole more pills, um, all this stuff. They just like ransacked it. But the one thing they didn't get, I had a few thousand dollars in a slipper that I owed someone. And I was like, boom, cha-ching, my ticket out of here. So uh, I was just like, no way am I going to jail. So I hopped on a Greyhound, went to Indiana, said goodbye to my family there, told them I was going to Backpack Europe. And then I went to Chicago, hopped on a train in New York, told my family the truth there, my dad's side. And I was like, yeah, I'm on the run and I'm getting out of here. And they were all <laughs> sad. And I hopped on a plane, JFK to Amsterdam, with a few thousand bucks in my pocket. I didn't joy. know anyone. Real so quick, you, quick so, question. You, you went to Indiana. Where you got relatives there? Yeah. What part? Uh, Valpo and um, kind of near yeah. Chicago, uh, Maryland. Yeah. Yeah. Maryville? Maryville, yeah, Maryville. Sorry. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, That's not right up there by Mike. That's right there by Mike. I live in the yeah. Indianapolis, so. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right, so, so and Ian, for, for someone who sort of struggles with uh, addiction, as you've already mentioned, you land in Amsterdam with a few thousand dollars in your pocket. That has to be good for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so Ian, terrible. What, what, made, what made you pick Amsterdam? What made yeah. you pick that place? It's one of the cheaper um, tickets, too. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Looking back now, I probably should have went to Mexico. Um, That's what I would have thought, Mexico. Uh, but I don't know. I just, like, I just always had this idea I was going to go backpack Europe. I just thought Europe was just a cool place. And yeah. um, I knew I knew it was relatively cheap, like, to live in a hostel and to kind of do the backpacking thing. So, yeah, I don't, you know... <laughs> I mean, we used to watch so, the movie Euro Trip. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at this point, is, is your is your plan really like I'm never coming back to the states? Is that what your thought is? Or are you just thinking this is just a temporary thing? I got to figure shit out. What, what are you thinking or not thinking? You know, um, I was thinking. Uh, so I was doing a lot of Google searching, and uh, so one 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 website said five years statute of limitations. One said seven. Okay. And and then it, so I was like, man, I can just stay out of the country for five to seven years and okay, I'll come back okay. and have a clean record. I even thought about joining the French Foreign Legion because um, I know you can do five years there and they change your name and you learn French. And um, but so I changed my name on Facebook. It was Ian Nitos. I made an alias and I fled the country. And, uh, you know, you, first thing I get to Amsterdam, kind of just still in party vacation mode, drinking absinthe, uh, smoking weed. <laughs> <laughs> passing out on the street i went to jail the first night in amsterdam uh, woke up like oh my gosh i just ran from this what am i doing and i talked to the guards and i was like i'm so sorry i'm such a dumb american please let me out and um and basically they were like all right where do you stay and it was like four in the morning the only address i could remember was the club that these canadians told me to meet him at when i met him at the coffee shop so i told this cop the address to this club and he literally drove me to the club and I got out of the cop car and walked in the club and I was like man this Europe is a lot different and, uh, <laughs> so it wasn't good for me man I was I was uh you know I was I was so running young. from an addiction I was running from the law and um you can't really run from yourself you know well yeah. you're always there <laughs> yeah yeah and mirror yeah no for sure all right so now you're in amsterdam and, and ladies and gentlemen we will get to his fights eventually but this is fantastic stuff and, and it, it kind of tells you where he's he came from like dude you're talking about bottoms that people just the depths that people don't go to and you've bounced back so i think that's the kind of the amazing key, well, yeah the key thing amazing. in this so you're in amsterdam and how long are you there before you make it to Colombia? Um, so I'm in Amsterdam for like a few months, completely run out of money. Um, you know, I call my cousin, he's got a friend in Belgium. He says, go down to Belgium. Um, literally we had no money. Like I had to get Western and a few bucks to get a ticket on a bus to go down to Belgium. He's like, you can live with my buddy for a little bit. You can look for a job. Uh, went over down to Bruges, Belgium, um, got this passport, uh, or got my resume that I printed out a long time ago. It even had like my wrestling <laughs> achievements on it and i'm like walking around to bars and restaurants handing out this american resume and they're looking at me super crazy finally this irish pub 
Uh, this guy's like, yeah, man. He's like, we'll hire you. He's like, you got a work visa? I was like, oh, yeah, I do. It's just in the mail. You know how the mail is here. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, cool. So I'm working in the kitchen. Six months goes by, kind of making a decent living, just keeping my head down. Can't really get too close with anyone, you know. You just tell anyone your business too much and they get mad at you. They can always call the cops on you, you know, and 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 uh, get you sent away. And um, I finally, I meet this crazy English guy. He comes from the Canary Islands, Tenerife. And he met this Belgian girl. He moved over there. And this kid, this kid's wild. And I, I got to meet up with him again on UFC London. Um, but <laughs> he shows up. He he don't have family. I mean, he's he's a wild dude. He's still wild to this day. He was actually on Below the Deck. He made it on that show on, on Bravo. Um, but I met this dude. And, and one night, we were getting ready to close down the bar. I was closing down the kitchen. He was closing down the bar. And the boss left us there alone, which was probably a really bad idea. And all of a sudden came in this huge bachelorette party. It was called a hem party because they're English. And man, we just partied there all night, like drinking up behind the bar. Like he hooked up with a chick on the pool table and I hooked up with one of the, it was, it was just a mess. The boss showed up the next day. He showed up, he, pr he looked at the footage. He printed out the Canadian thing and he was like, we're not paying you. You're fired. You're lucky we don't call the police. And we made him, we walked into the register. We're like, you're going to pay us and you'll never see us again. He paid us. I looked at the English guy. I was like, what do we do now? He's like, I'll get us a job, mate. And I was like, all right, let's go. And so we hopped on a ferry to England. His idea of us working and getting a job was us working, living and working, painting an apartment, basically a shell, no furniture, electricity, hot water, nothing in this apartment. We painted it in a day and it was like ice cold winter in London or in uh, oh. not London. It was, it was Leeds um, <laughs> and uh, in the North of England. So I'm like, bro, I can't do this for long. And so we ended up getting a job at a club PR. -ing. And uh, once again, you know, back to the addiction, drinking and working at the club scene. He tried to like rob the safe a little bit later. I was like, I don't know him. He fled. He disappeared. Um, I ended up living in England for about eight months working at clubs. And uh, I just. Were you talking I to your parents at all during this time? Or did you completely separate yourself out of fear that the, uh, the police might be listening to their phone conversations no i was talking to my parents yeah how, how, is, well, how are you crossing borders are you just presenting your american passport or yeah i actually got issued a passport when i posted bail on my felony warrants yeah i couldn't believe it apparently they don't really care if you leave it's just when you come back if that I makes sense i mean i'm sure if you're like a wanted murderer and you're wanted by interpol then you got problems you know okay i understand yeah that letter is a da that just you know wasn't doing their job because in europe Maybe. they'll put a hold on it especially like in in the netherlands like or, or in you know like you said you were in leeds they'll put a hold England. on it oh for sure yeah but go ahead go ahead. this is this is good stuff go ahead yeah so you. So I'm in I'm in England for you know eight months and uh, it's cool but uh, you know I'm broke and cold and I just did not like the weather I wasn't a fan of like the culture to say and uh, so I started getting some XC pills shipped over there I was like let's see what I can do over here and, from the uh, same hookup it, yeah yeah so uh, Guatemala sell, yeah actually <laughs> they came from Canada Vancouver oh, okay. But they were Guatemalans. They were part of the Mexican cartel. Um, actually, the one guy, not the connection, but his brother just got shot and killed uh, in Guatemala like probably six months ago. Wow. Obviously, they didn't get out the game. Um, A rough life. So, yeah. And um, so I get some pills sent over. And England is the, like the worst scene to try to sell drugs. They do the grossest, cheapest, nastiest drugs there. They don't care. And so it just wasn't for me. I sold it to some guys. I hopped on a plane, went down to Tenerife, the Canary Islands, got off the plane. It was like paradise to me. I was like, I heard about it from the English people. I was like, they speak English there and it's a beach and it's hot. And I was like, this is great. I got off the plane. I remember it was just like blonde chicks speaking Spanish. I was like, this is so great. And so I hopped, I walked on the beach, drank the 12 pack, walked down to where the club scene was. And I like walked up on him. I was like, Hey, you guys need to, uh, workers they're like yeah you're hired and i was like okay i remember working that first night basically they paid you in drinks eight drinks when you work 
four drinks when you get off, you get a euro a person you bring in. Uh, three months of this, I'm full blown alcoholic, homeless, can't pay even th- 30 euros a week to sleep in just a, a bed, just to rent a bed in like a big uh, room in the ghetto. And so sleeping on the beach, friends, couches, uh, park. Oh, that's gross. And, yeah. Just, just at the low of the low. And uh, were you working out at all? Were you working out or doing anything like physical? Uh, no, not, not, not in those three months. Definitely not. What about like in, was, when you were in the United Kingdom? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I was um, just lifting weights. So you weren't in any of the MMA or jiu-jitsu gyms there? No. Man, to Kimei, if you can't show people met Lee Murray. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm basically homeless, you know, don't have, I'm rock bottom, right? So I meet this guy from Miami and, uh, you know, he's one of the only Americans on the island. And he's like, hey, gringo, come live with us, man. Like, I don't want to see you living like this. And they took me in like family. They still are like family. I started hitting the gym, getting sober actually started training a little bit of MMA down there with some Croatians and Russians. And then um, it was about a month in and he sat me down. He's like, Hey gringo, let's go make some real money. And I was like, yeah, what, for, what are we going to do? And he's like, Columbia gringo. And I was like, yeah, let's go. It was uh, perfect for me. So we started taking trips, Colombia, Venezuela, Aruba. And we were taking these trips, wrapping a kilo of Coke, swallowing it, bringing it back. The first few trips, I was just kind of a mule. He's paying me pretty good. And he's like, hey, gringo, save your own money and you can do this yourself. About six trips down there, um, I was in Bogota Airport. And this Wait, so you were swallowing an entire kilo. Yeah, close. How do you, in like Fuck. several different bags or something? Or how do you, I mean, yeah, how do you... Uh, 10, 10 grams in like a ball like that big. Is it, is it like a condom? It's like they put them in like a condom no, or, a, no. or a balloon? A balloon? Um, so we would put them in plastic and then we would. Because if they um, explode, would, you, you die. And, yeah, because we would, I would. The first time I let someone else wrap it, and that was like one of the most scary experiences. And then I started doing it all myself. You take black tape, tape it up. We put it in hot water, let it turn it into like a, like a, like a plastic shell. And then four layers of surgical gloves. Tie it, tie it off, cut it, drop it in the other way four layers and then there was a special paper we put around it, it was real reflecty and they were like this is what will pass the x-ray and i was like i didn't know if they were just trying to make me feel better um but it was my seventh trip or so i'm in the bogota airport some just black dude in street clothes comes up to me and he's like dami su pasaporte and i'm like uh no comprende i don't speak spanish he's like give me your passport and i'm like who are you and he's like boom secret police and i was like whoa Okay. And he's like, oh, gringo. He's like, yeah, you like Colombia, huh? And I was like, oh, yeah, I got a girlfriend here, you know? And he's like, yeah, 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 sit down. And I was like, oh, okay. And I like sit down. And it was like two sketchy looking dudes and a smoking hot chick. And I'm like, what are we doing here? And they're like, we're going to the x-ray. And I was like, oh, my gosh. So I'm like freaking out inside, like trying not to um, you don't show want to poop. Exter- You definitely don't yeah. want to poo. No. Trying not to, <laughs> trying not to, to poo. Yeah, and, for sure, uh, no. So, so they walk us to this big room, man. It's got this big machine. Get in there. <laughs> and they're like, Tina one dia, senor Heinrich. Like, Have a good day, sir. Sign, fingerprint. Man, that adrenaline dump. That compares to, like, fighting, winning a fight, um, <laughs> walking out of that room. I was just like, whoa. And, and then after that, so we started getting a little cocky, you know. I'm like, what are they going to do, throw me in the x-ray? So then we started taking trips sooner, two weeks out, three weeks before we used to wait three months and uh, just started to kind of get cocky with it. And uh, eventually about 11, 12 trips in, um, we went from Aruba to Caracas to, to straight to Tenerife. And um, usually we don't do that. We usually go to Barcelona or Madrid, the mainland, Spain, and then go in. And um, so I show up there. They look through my passport. They're like, man, you have a ton of stamps. And uh, and I was just like, yeah, 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 I have a girlfriend here. I'm just a rich American, blah, blah, blah. My girlfriend comes around. She comes in. She verifies. They let me go. I walk down to the parking garage. The Colombian's waiting for me. Right when we walk in there, boom, secret police. They jump on us. Same deal, though. They're going to take us to the extra. I'm like, let's go. I'm like talking, you know, big game, talking smack to these dudes. Like, 
I'm a tourist and you're making me go to the x-ray and but the problem now, was, do, you, do you think do you think somebody may have been tipping them off or it was just a kind of something random because the way they're approaching you seems like it's almost like a game plan just you got to think man i'm the only white boy coming from venezuela first off second off uh some colombian dudes waiting for me in the garage parking garage and third i got like 12 stamps in my passport so big red flags you know maybe okay. who knows nobody knows but um so we went there and now usually they just throw us an x-ray in the airport because they have them but because this is like a third world country basically they don't have them so they took us to the hospital and they do the real oh. x-ray you know the plaque and with yeah and so um you know like they're like don't move and i'm like and they're like, no, no. And they finally laid me down so I could not move. And they took the x-ray. And they were all, like, apologizing. They couldn't see anything. We're gonna, they're like, we're just going to have the head doctor sign off on this. And you'll be good to go. And um, and I was like, yeah, this is BS. My girlfriend's crying. Blah, blah, blah. And then the head doctor, this beautiful Spanish girl, puts it on this light. And she's like, yep. She's like, tells me in Spanish. She's like, you have drugs, balls of drugs in your intestines. What is it? Heroin, cocaine? And I was like, nah. And she's like, yeah, no, it's seguro. She's telling me. And I'm like, nah. And she's like, yes. And I'm like, oh, I eat some Chinese food. You keep food. saying no. You know, just <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And I said I ate some Chinese food. And they were like, shut up. <laughs> Last time I ate at that Chinese food place, they put drugs in your food. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they got me. I'll never eat so, there again. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. You know, detox in the airport. It's a different or, x-ray. Right. The, the hospital x-rays are actually yeah, like a 3d imaging to where uh, like it's just uh, stronger yeah yeah in the airport it's more of like a 2d 1d imaging type thing yeah it's it's yeah, I mean, that's not where you want to be so those x-rays that if you're talking about the thing that goes like this boom, boom or the yeah. other one those only look on in outside on your skin yeah i don't well, if you get pulled there's they have a room that they pull you in and it's like a big machine and it's like a treadmill <laughs> And you stand up and it like does this and it scans your stomach. Really? Um, but, but anyway, so I'm a year in prison, no court date, nothing, no, nothing, no lawyers, no embassy. Seems embassy, legit. What a joke. Yeah. Just chilling in prison. Like, man, oh. looking at this guy from Colombia, man, maybe it was fake and they're just going to let us out, you know? But in this time, man, it was the worst thing that ever happened to me. Well, did you call the, the American time. embassy at, at all? Uh, they at first they were like, "Do you want to call the American Embassy?" And I was like, "Nah, I'm good," <laughs> because I'm like, "I'm I wanted there warrant. too." <laughs> yeah, I wanted there too. I was like, "Nah, I'm good." <laughs> and honestly, they didn't even know. Eventually, eventually, someone told them, and I was I thought it was the end of the world because they were gonna know. But dude, the embassy is such a joke, man. They're just a bunch <laughs> of girls over there drinking with Spanish dudes. They don't care. I mean, the Irish embassy, the English embassy, they were giving them money, magazines, like phone calls. And the American embassy, you'd be lucky to, if you put a notice in, you'd be lucky a month later if some chick showed up like, yeah, what can I do? And nice. just like, yeah, I mean, it's pretty, you thought American embassy, you would you would get some stuff done. But it, it, I mean, it's bad, man. I'm going to, uh, you know, I want to be an activist. I want to speak out. But the, the great thing was, man, I got locked up in Spain. They had a wrestling program. It was called Lucha Canadia. Usually you got to sign this waiver thing and it takes three months to get on. Mm -hmm. I went straight up to the coach who the coach actually ended up being Juan Espino's father. So he's a UFC fighter. He's the first Spanish UFC fighter. And wow. he is the, he's the best to ever do it. This, this sport called Lucha Canadia. It's okay. called, and his father, he was, he was locked up in there for like, uh, you know, a bunch of kilos of coke. I don't know, um, something like that. But I, <laughs> I just showed up. I showed up, and I was like, he was like, I was like, I was like, bro, I'm not doing the like, fill out this paper. I was like, I just pointed at my cauliflower ear, and he was like, all right, let's go. And so they let me wrestle. Fuck I loved yeah. it, and it, it really made me fall in love with it again. Um, you know, I was beating all the guys in the prison, and a lot of them had been like on the professional teams. Then a professional team came in and me and one other American there, some crazy American from Chicago was there. And uh, we beat a professional team from the streets because he wrestled in high school too. And it was like Do you best remember out of three. Uh, yeah, Blair Holton. Yeah, it's my boy. Blair Holton, yeah, okay. 
Holton Blair. Yes. And, uh, yeah, he's, uh, we're, he's doing great, man. He's married. He has a kid. Um, you know, he really changed his life too. I'm happy for him, but he was a psychopath in there and he, he, he saved me. He honestly was a big asset for me in there. And, uh, it was good to have one other American around, but we were, so this sport, Lucha Canaria, you wear like a gi, you roll it up, you go shoulder to shoulder, you grab the gi, uh, best out of three takedowns, elimination, one team versus one team. So it's last team standing. So it's like wrestling, but it's a team sport. And you're in a sand pit, like a gladiator pit. So it's kind of like Polaris on UFC Fight Pass. Like you keep going through the team until you stop, and then they put the next team member in? Um, yeah. So you okay. you would go with the lightest guy. The two lightest guys would go. One would win. Then a heavier guy would come in. The Whoever would right. win keeps going. The last team who has people is the winner. Um, so I fell in love with that. It made me just fall in love with wrestling and they had a kickboxing program there, started doing that, started going to church, find a relationship with God, um, went to alcohol classes, learned Spanish, um, just complete, like, you know, reforming and, and getting sober, you know, and, uh, honestly, I was still doing my, my prescription of Xanax at night. Um, I was still smoking weed, smoking hash when I could get a hold of it. Um, but I was more focused on, I was like, man, I don't belong here with these people, man. I, and like, God was just putting on my heart, like, I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to win the UFC belt. And like, it was like my, my parents would like send me UFC magazines. Like, uh, what is it actually? I have it right here. Um, it was, uh, what's the famous, and I actually made it in the magazine. That was a so I full contact was, fighter back in the uh, day. Um, uh, Gosh, where is it? Fighters. I you think you almost fighters said fighters only. Yeah, fighters only. There we go. Yes, you said a subscription. Yeah, so I I uh I had one magazine of that and I was like looking at Dana White and Sean Shelby and I was like, man, these are the guys I need to meet. I was like, I was like, this is what's gonna happen. And I just I just hung it on my wall, man, and, and I just trained my body every day. I was like mind, body, spirit every single day. I was reading books. I never had read books. I would just train my spirit i was reading the bible and i would train my body every single day and uh about a year in year and a half i had visits with my girlfriend in there and um i had my contacts because i have terrible vision but now i got the prk but um i i they put us in the newspaper um for the wrestling thing and i was like i've done this sport that sport but i love lucha canaria and the, the prison guard, the warden of the prison, got a letter from the Federation of Lucha Canaria and was like, keep this kid here because we're going to sign him when he gets out of prison because we want to – and I even thought, like, maybe this is going to be my career. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, um, I, get a, I, get, I get the guards coming in my cell and they throw a bag in my face. And they're like, pack your stuff. You're going. And they con air Spain where I didn't know any to a place called Leon. And it's in the north of Spain, and it took like it was like crazy, bro. Like like out of the movies, Con Air. All these police had black. Um, they had the black ski masks on. Man, her heads were down. What like was the this. reason for the move? Uh, they just didn't like that I was. Um, they didn't like that I was good at their sport, and I was beating them. They didn't like an American coming in there and being good at their sport. Um, really? Do you think they knew that maybe you were doing your Xanax and hash at night? Do you think there was issues with that as well? No, everyone was, every, everyone was getting a bag of pills in there. They, they, they're heavy on like sedating their people. They, yeah. No, so it had, to deal no, with it had nothing to do with that. Yeah. Like there's a lot of ethnic wrestling, like around the world where they have like little rule nuances. I'd always heard about like Senegalese. Yeah. 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 Or, or like in Georgia and like those places, like they have ones where like they tie themselves together. I mean, just there's so many variants. The Canary, the, like the Canary Island wrestlers, even have a reputation in Spain as being like extra tough dudes. So I was going to yeah. ask you about that. You beat me to it. <laughs> yeah. So like actually, the history of the Canary Islands, it's like islands off the coast of Morocco, and they're they're actually pirate islands. The pirates used to hang out there and wait for the Europeans to come down to America and they would go hijack their ships. But Tenerife, the island I lived on, the savage locals, Indonesians, in, how do you say that? Um, the savage... Indigenous? Indigenous people would kill the pirates so the pirates wouldn't go to Tenerife. Here's wow. the, the magazine, the 
fighters only. This is when I made um, in that magazine. That was like a, a big deal. Nice. And then, mm -hmm. and then I made That's it cool. in this one too. So that was, that was a huge accomplishment for me just cause I, this was the thing I had in prison, you know? Oh, okay. So, so they, you're, you're bottoming out, but you're not yet. I mean, you haven't bottomed out yet. Well, he like, saved for instance, himself like, so far. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you're still kind of teetering with addiction at this point. Like how, yeah. how much soon, like how, how much further do you go before you kind of get serious about your sobriety? I mean, I was pretty serious, man. Like, uh, you know, I mean, I, it, compared to what I was doing, mm -hmm. um, you know, I couldn't get alcohol like I, I did. Um, and I mean, we were drinking prison hooch when we had it, taking my Xanax at night and smoking a little bit. It was nothing like I was doing, doing coke, drinking okay. every single day, morning and night. So I felt like I was taking a step. But yeah, I wasn't I wasn't full surrender, man. I was I was still plagued by my addiction, you know. Right. And and, and um, but so I went to the north of Spain. They had a boxing program there and um, you could take this class. They actually let me start an MMA program. So I did boxing twice a day. I did MMA. They even had like fights and stuff. The people would come down. The guards would come down, put bets on it. It was kind of cool. It was like a kind of like a sparring match but kind of like the movies too it was really cool and so i get to the end of my sentence and um they they give me a paper that says you can't come back to spain for the next five years i sign a paper that says yeah i won't come back so they cut off a quarter of my sentence so boom um they throw me in a car they throw me to the airport they finally let me go they give the passport to the flight attendant i'm free man on this airplane flying to new york and i'm like I'm like probably acting super weird, like talking to chicks, just like walking around, like, oh my gosh, I'm free for the first time in two and a half years. And I knew when I landed in New York, I was probably going right back to jail. Oh. And um, so I land in New York. They give me my passport. Um, I go to the custom line. Uh, they scan my passport. How long have you been out the country, sir? I'm like, a while. And they're like, what's a while? And I'm like, uh, five years. They're like, yeah, come with me. <laughs> Stayed in immigration and JFK. I thought about running, but I was like, man, 9-11, they're definitely going to catch me. Their security is high. And um, so they kept me in there for um, for three days. Then they threw me in Jamaica Queen jailhouse for four days. And it was over the weekend. So it was just terrible. Like usually hips and bums and, and just people were coming off heroin and puking. And I'm just sitting there and people are it's just a revolving door. People coming in and out. Except me, I never get my name called. And, uh, and I was like, what is going on, Garden? He's like, you're a special case. Just shut up and sit over there. And finally, this public defender comes up to me and she's like, you're going to Rikers Island. You need to go to protective custody. And I was like, what's Rikers? I didn't even know what Rikers was. And they're like, so yeah, you you're going to go to Rikers. You're not going to protective custody. No, I was like, I've been in prison two and a half years. And my mentality is like, throw me at the wolves. I'll lead the pack. Um, I was like, I ain't going to Punk City. No. And, uh, and so, but I had no idea what Rikers was. And so they driving me to Rikers. It's this long road. And I'm yeah. like, man, this is, this is really an Island. And then there's like <laughs> one fence the next fence. I'm like, man, this is real. And so we get there and the guards walking me to my wing and he's like, man, you must be one bad white boy. And I was like, why is that? He's like, we had never seen one of you here. And I was like, what? And in my mind, I was like, you damn right. Or, right. but in my mind, I was like, what is he talking about? And because I was in the maximum security because I was a fugitive. So they were throwing me in maximum security. So, I mean, yeah, I but, stayed but, there for about. But Ian, Ian, if you go PC, you, one, you could never check out because everyone's going to know that you were there. And look at the, you'd be with all super like crazy sex offenders, like people are just warped. Like you couldn't go PC. Like it's, I'd rather take the ass kicking and, you know, maybe it's some stolen commissary. I mean, you can't go PC. I mean, would you all, agree with that? All the, all the white boys were in PC. Oh. <laughs> so I got taken to court four days in a row. I got taken to court. They would literally be like, Heinish, you have court. I mean, there was just oh, with a name boys like Heinish. Oh, my and, God. Uh, and they're like, you have court. And I would so I'd go to court. And basically, you know, you got to go stand in line, pull your pants down, bend over and cough, get shackled up drive across that long thing, go to Jamaica Queens jailhouse, sit in there, eat peanut butter and jelly, gross, disgusting sandwiches for eight hours, 
No lawyer, what, no judge. What would they call back you? To, what was your nickname? Uh, why they keep calling I, you? To, I, why they keep calling you there? So that's what I was wondering. Purposes. So they, but they, they gave me no judge, no lawyer. I didn't see nobody. So it was like th- three days in. Luckily, when I got to this wing, I speak Spanish fluent, right? So the Latinos kind of took me in like family. Thank <laughs> God, because I was probably going to Dude, not what was your nickname? They had to call you something. Uh, no, nah, I don't. Really? You, know, you were walking down the hallway and they weren't yelling like snowman, you know, anything like that at you? White boy? Yeah, definitely white boy. Hmm. Probably white boy. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah, you're definitely catching a nickname, bro. I mean, I nothing. Okay, go ahead. Nothing that stood out to me. But anyway, so this is three days in, and uh, so one of these days to speak out to your protect custody thing. One of these days, I was at the courthouse, and I'm looking, and it's one of those uh, mirrors that's kind of bent, and you can see like in the cell next to it, and it's a cell full of like eight white boys, and I was like, I was like, where? And I asked, I asked the brother next to me, I was like. Who are those white boys over there? He's like, oh, those are those chumps from Punk City. And I was like, what? And so, dude, I just like went off on this rant. I was like, I was like, you pussy ass mother. I was like, I'm over here holding it down and and general population. We can stick together and be fine. But your pussy ass is over here in protect custody, making us look bad as a race. I was like, what is wrong with you? And like this dude's like, get them. And I'm just over here just, like, tearing them up, getting all worked up about it. So, like, no, I don't. You're institutionalized. I know, I know you're what you're saying. I know what you're, I know what you're saying, though. But uh, so I get back. I get I get back on the fourth day, man. And I'm just so furious that I have to keep going to court. I have no, no idea what's going on. And, uh, and finally, they tell me I have no bail um, because I'm a fugitive and I just have to wait to get deported. And uh, so once again, waiting to get deported. And I come back, and one of the guys are not deported, extradited, extradited back, back uh, to Colorado. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. It's uh, dude, it's so, gonna probably be about 30 to 45 days. Yes. Yep. That's exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And you're gonna be going to court probably what every you, two uh, or three days. Yeah. US Marshal or what? Nah, dude. I, I was former I, I was in law enforcement for like 15 years, bro. I just got out, yeah. man. Like I like you're you're bringing back. I'm getting PTSD from listening to this. All right, so go ahead. Go ahead. I, I feel a different sort of pain for you, Ian, because I grew up flushing and Jamaica is there's a board. They, they border each other. I grew up about 10 miles from that building in that courthouse. <laughs> oh, a, so you, yeah. oh, so you know, I know that area. Yeah, <laughs> man. It, I mean, I hope they close that jail. If you've seen the Khalif Broder documentary, you should watch that. Jay-Z made it. It's really sad. Um, but that prison's wild, man. The guards come in. What up, blood? What up, blood? To the inmates, like, because they're homies on the street. Yeah, I mean, no, they're I all gang banging. That, they're, they're all, all gang banging, man. Yeah. They're they're turning their heads, letting people get stomped to death. Like, I mean, it, <laughs> it's bad, man. Like you're seeing, like, like every day was like all the all the two and a half years. That month and a half was the worst by far. Well, well uh, when you get any fights there? Was there any fights with you involved there? Or? So I get back on like the third day in a row going to court and I get back and one of the guys comes up to me. I'm not going to mention his affiliation, but he's like, yo man, I'm going to use your phone. And like, I would trade him chips for a phone call. And I was just not having it. I was like, no, no one's using, I was like, no one's touching. No, you're talking about a phone on the wall. Am I correct? Yeah. Like, like you give him a a pay phone. Yeah. Yeah. So so let let me set the table. So there's probably three, four, five pay phones. And they're all run by certain gangs. So each gang gets their own phone and you got to pay to get in there. And also, Ian, like, as you know, when you dial a number on the phone, you've got to cover it with your other hand because there's people there that have nothing to do all day and no one to call. And they'll memorize your like your your hand movements. They will call those people and say, yeah, I'm friends with Ian. He needs you to man. make it through. He needs yeah. you to make a three-way phone call to this person for me. And they, they start using up your favors. And all of a sudden, you got no one to call. Go ahead, Ian. I apologize, man. So so, so you right. had a no. phone there that, I mean, why did they have to pay you to use a phone? It was just a public phone. Because it's all gang run. So but he, I had he's a not phone, having a gang, though. No. Let him, let him so I had a phone card, oh. right? Okay, okay. Yeah. So I had a card, and they wanted to use my card because you only get three phone calls a day or something. And I had been gone all day. They knew I had my phone calls. They wanted to use my card to make another phone call. 
they pay me, they give me a bag of chips or something yeah. as a trade for it. But I was just not having it, man. And these dudes saw me shadow boxing in my cell and they're like, man, you think you train, you think you fight? We train for real on the streets. And I'm like, yeah, cool, man, whatever. Like, you know, and so this dude, he's like, all right, you not let me use the phone. See me in the back. Bathroom. Like, okay. Bathroom or back? Like, the back. So like Crash. back of the hall. Right. They didn't need to hide in the bathroom here. Um, so I go to the back. I think this dude's going to fight me. He's Jack, dude, you know, and I roll up on him and boom, he pulls out this rusty shank on me, man. And he's oh. like doing this and he's like getting like this. And I'm like, and, but I learned a few tricks in prison and it's from my boy Blair. And I was like, man, please don't hurt me, man. Please, please. And I just saw his chin and he let his guard down. And boom. I just blasted him. And uh, all his brothers came running up and, and I was just like, man, I'm about to get stabbed from every angle. So I took my shirt off, wrapped it around my hand to try to grab knives. And uh, and then three little Latino dudes jumped in front, man. And they were like, yo, you mess with white boy. You mess with us. He got heart. He would. Up. Damn. And I was like, and so fingers Prison came politics. up to me. And fingers came up to me later that night. And he was like, he was the leader of the, la or the gang, the Latino gang. And he, you know, he's missing a few fingers. He was like, yo, man, we like you, but um, you ain't one of us. So you got to, you got to, you know. Hey, you got to go to you got to go to protect custody. They're gonna kill you tomorrow morning. You got an SOS on you, and I was like, "What's Boy, that?" SOS like, means stop on site. In other words, anyone sees them, you gotta you gotta fuck them up. Oh, so I remember I called the guard over. And I was like, "Guard, I gotta get out of here. These guys want to kill me. I gotta go to protect custody." And so it was that serious. Man. Like they weren't lying to you, huh? Oh, dude, I was, I was ready to go, man. Like they were. They were coming for me the, in the morning, <laughs> and the guard told me, F "Could you just stay in your cell? Could you stay in your cell all day, or they make no. you get out?" I tried to move and protect custody, and the guard told me, "F you, white boy." He was going to open my cell door in the morning and let him rush me. So I was literally all night awake talking to fingers. Like literally, I was reading the the book uh, "Art of War." I was like, "I'm going to funnel him in this little corner, and I'm going to fight him." Like I was making armor. I like flipped all my bed. I like turned my whole cell inside out. Was just didn't sleep at all. Just praying to God, like Lord, just deliver me from this. Like protect me. Like have something happen where this doesn't happen. And literally, the doors opened at six. It was five a.m. and some two big football player dudes came walking over. And they're like, "Heinish!" And I like jumped up, and they're like looked at me super weird because my cell was like torn up all crazy. <laughs> And they were like, uh, they're like, let's go. And I was like, who are you? And they're like, U.S. Marshal. And I was just like, oh, my gosh. They walked me past all those guys. They're like, wherever we go, we're going to get you, white boy. And uh, so, yeah, I guess I, that was my nickname, white boy. And, mm, uh, yeah. and I had all this stuff in the front, and there was, like, passport and all this stuff. They're like, do you have any personal belongings? And I was like, no, let's go. Mm -hmm. I didn't want any trustees or anyone. To, I was just like, let's get out of here. And then so, that started. So, in other words, like sometimes the guards, obviously the guards are gangbanging there. But also, if somebody is getting transported the next day, the guards will say that to them. What happens is inmates will borrow food, commissary, whatever. They'll eat it all up, knowing they're getting transferred in the morning. So, I mean, it, it, it probably may have looked like that, or the officer was just like, I know you're getting transferred. I'm not doing shit. He's lazy anyway, so... It is what it is. You got saved. Yeah. At politics and prison saved. is super interesting. Yeah. So I got, I got saved, man. And, uh, and then after that shackled from my hands to my feet, doing Just, laps around the country like this, nine days in a back of a van, the heat was broken in the back. I remember ice being on the top, wasn't sleeping, was shivering at night, just bobbing my head. Only let us go to the bathroom every six hours. I mean, treated like a total animal. I remember 48 hours we were back in New York because I think they make money every time they cross state line, uh, if I'm correct. So they went to like Pennsylvania to Vermont, back to New York. We were just doing circles like this. And finally, I made it to Colorado 14 days later, <laughs> made it to Jefferson County. Couldn't even like was I was at the point of like hallucinating. I hadn't slept in so long. Um, finally made it there. Um, got bailed out 2014 Valentine's Day. Um Knew immediately I needed to find a gym. Didn't drink any alcohol. Um, found a gym Good. called Factory X. Um, stayed away from alcohol. <laughs> went to a gym called Factory X. and um, With uh, Mark Montoya. Went, 
yeah, Mark Montoya uh, took me in like a, was the father figure I needed at that time. Took me in um, uh, my first four amateur fights, all finishes in the first round, and then got to like my sixth pro well, fight. Um, you Ian, would you, would you mind if we walk through it a little bit because it's actually pretty interesting. Yeah. Okay, Mike, so Mike's done some research here. Yeah, dude, I got a ton of notes on this. So this is usually like where, where we come in and we do the deep dive on, on your actual career. So your first fight, August 23rd, 2014, is with Sparta. It's a real high-end organization out of Colorado, and you fought Arturo Mata. Mm-hmm. Do you remember that? Do you remember your first fight? Oh, yeah. So Well, actually, I, I fought two kickboxing fights before that, um, two, like, smokers. Okay. And uh, I, I finished the one with leg kicks and I draw and I KO'd the other guy with the jab. And then I fought my first MMA fight. Um, was it Arturo Mata? Because I think it's it was, the first one on uh, record. Oh, okay. Jonathan Cox. Jonathan Cox was July 28th, 2014. Oh, okay. You know what? You're right. I got it. I got it. Yeah, it was July 28th. Yeah, that is your first one. Come on, so you fought Jonathan okay. Cox. And yeah, I fought and Jonathan, Jonathan Cox, a, a decorated wrestler, actually. He was from American Top Team as well, and he had, like, a lot of gym time. Yeah. So it's a, it's a hard first opponent. For sure. So yeah. um, do you want to walk us through it? Do you, I mean, what were your feelings yeah. going into your first bout, like your first MMA bout? I mean, your first fight, it was just like, you know, you're, you're nervous. You don't know what to expect. Um, get in there, and it just, you know, you're holding your breath, swinging as hard as you can. Um it was a it was a wild wrestling exchange, probably one of my hardest fights for the first like two years of my career. Um, but I dominated, threw some good knees, took him down, uh, finally got my hooks in on his back and submitted him. And uh, then I fought Arturo Mata. He rushed me. I, I flipped him on his back, ground and pounded him, submitted him. So so these uh, these two guys, they're from like high end gyms. Like our uh, Johnson yeah. Cox is from American Top Team, and in between rounds. Jonathan Cox is telling his corner, he's hurt. He's hurt. I got him. And if you look at Ian, he's he's a front horse, and, and he still fight that way. And you're real explosive right away. Like, you're real aggressive. Like, I, I think you're probably some one of the more aggressive fighters I've ever seen in regards to your activity at the beginning of a, uh, of a round. Yeah. So well, you, you go through quick, how, how, long, how long have you been training at this point? How long have you been getting ready for this? <clears throat> Is it a couple months in, six months? And how long have you been training? Uh, probably six months. What, what was the date on that again? So you, July 20, 2014. And then you go, I mean, a month later, August 23rd. And Arturo Matos with DCO MMA. So essentially Factory X, which is also a very established gym, is yeah. putting them in a, up against other legitimate gyms. It's not like they're they're feeding them kind of guys off the street getting his feet wet no i i've never fought easy guys even in my ufc career yeah. I, I was yeah, he's, he's my second fight i mean i yeah. know factory x is a good gym and they've got good people and <clears throat> trainers how are you doing with you know the other guys in the gym like just rolling working out i mean do you feel like pretty quick you were you were moving up pretty quick and, and giving people difficulties yeah i mean it shows that it was july and august when i fought and i was free so you I was free from prison 2000 or I was free from prison February 14th. I probably found factory X probably in March. So March, April, May, June, July. So I probably trained four months. And I remember my first bar and I sparred Chris Camozzi, Brian Rogers, and um, there might've been someone else, but I was it Nate Marquardt. Uh, no, he wasn't there at that time. He came a little bit later. But I was doing very well with these guys. I'd get submitted sometimes and stuff. But and obviously on the feet, I wasn't. Um, my hands weren't as developed yet. But uh, I mean, I, my wrestling, I was, I was dominating them in the wrestling. I was big. I was strong. I was aggressive, like you said. And uh, my coach saw that, so he he wasn't he wasn't worried about matching me up with um, guys that come from high level gyms. His coach also was touting that this guy is the next big thing out of Colorado. Like he was very upfront about it. So let's talk about getting your hand raised. Like we talked about that crazy story up until this time about how you got here, which most people take the other road and they're either locked in prison for the rest of their life or they're dead. You, on the other hand of, you know, you're, you're disciplined, you're setting goals and you get your hand raised July 20th, 2014. What kind of a rush was that? 
Um, you know, at the time, it wasn't. It didn't mean that much to me because I was just like, I'm coming for these UFC guys. Like <laughs> this is like it's not I, enough. Like, it, it really wasn't like um, it was just like, yep, next, next. Like I just like I just had a really like confidence and I just like brought a, like a lot of emotion to those fights, I think. And it, just like anger, uh, which I like slowly dissipated. I would say the most rush was after my UFC winning my UFC debut was like collapsing in the back and just like so happy and just tears and just joy. That was so. So going through the prison system, dealing with all like homeless, living on a beach, finally getting your first win, that wasn't enough for you, huh? No. Wow. That's insane. Now, now th- those were, are those amateur fights we're talking about right now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and you're a big ticket seller, too, because you kind of got this wild story. Everybody's talking about you. So when they announce Ian, like, the crowd is just it's deafening like you you had a lot of friends you had a lot of friends in Colorado that I think probably missed you dude yeah yeah absolutely yeah I mean from my wrestling career and stuff and people were excited I was you know doing something positive and not so I mean I I blew through the first four guys and then I get to like my sixth fight well, um, wait, 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 we gotta go a little bit. <laughs> Mike, okay. Mike was asking like, about it. Yeah, check this out. His third fight is against Anthony Harvey from Grudge Training Center, and it's actually a 205 pound title fight. So you're not even like cutting that much weight up until this point. And uh, Anthony Harvey, he's three and one, and his only loss is to Curtis Blades at heavyweight. So you got a heavyweight coming down to 205. Wow. And it's it's like a really fast exchange between the two of them do you, do you recall that yeah yeah so i i clipped him on the feet right off the bat and uh dropped him and then just rushed him and got on him <clears throat> got my hooks in ground and pound threw in the rear naked choke and submitted him yeah and so are you considering yourself more like are you a striker at this point or still a, a, a ground guy wrestle with skip people down to submit um all all ground guy i was a ground guy but I mean, yeah, you're dropping works. people with some pop bombs too. I mean, hard hands. Heavy hands <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm. Yeah, I'm throwing. I'm throwing bombs, and uh, that one just actually clipped him, and uh, kind of dazed him. It didn't. It wasn't like I sat him down, but it like dazed him, and then I, I rushed him with the the grappling. Okay, Chris, he's a front runner. Like when when you, yeah. he's when you think the fight is ready to start, he's already throwing punches. Like you guys touch gloves, we're good. When you're taking your breath and you're ready to settle in, he's throwing like a like a 15 punch combo, and it is just heavy, heavy, heavy punches. I'm just saying um, he'd be good at the bare knuckles, starting three feet. I, apart. Yeah, he for sure, would. <laughs> he absolutely would. Yeah, maybe after absolutely the UFC. Would. Um, <laughs> from there, like you're you're trying to you're getting quick turnarounds because you're setting goals for yourself. Are you clean at this time? Like, are, are you drinking at all or are you still like really focused, laser focused and, and trying to, yeah. you know, complete your goal? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm laser focused on the goal, but, um, you know, I haven't really dealt fully with my addiction. It's still following me. And, um, mm-hmm. there was probably three or four times I fell into alcohol and doing Coke and, um, I was taking Adderall kind of regularly <clears> and, um, that's what I was leading up to is my, I was going to fight, um, actually it was this fight, or I was going to fight, uh, in my first LFA fight, I was going to fight and, um, I tore my LCL. So I had to, the week before my sparring and, um, I went to the doctor, obviously got a rehab and got a prescription for Percocet oh. and took, took some painkillers instantly hooked. Um, oh. and, and Percocet's and, uh, that drug, dude, it's amazing. Hmm. it's just it's amazing like i i took one one time and i was just like i can't do this yeah yeah it's it's terrible though it's horrible yeah. so yeah. I, um so i took it um and uh and then I, and then i started justifying it in my head giving myself these excuses well the doctor said i'm in pain and the more you take painkillers the more pain you're actually in well, and so i was like I'm sorry, to, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but from an addiction perspective, you were talking about <laughs> cocaine and, and alcohol and things like that. Now, this is an opiate. 
is that yeah. was that new to your game kind of thing, or did it sneak up on you because yep. it's the prescription? Yeah, that was new to that was new. Yeah. Okay, and I mean it's 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 rough to give up, and it's very pleasing to you know to an addict. I mean, it's not the you know it's not the most addictive you know for a reason. I think so. Unfortunately, you know, yeah, that's dangerous territory, my friend. So, so Ian, yeah. to put this in proper context, two of the three of us have been to rehab in this conversation, not including yourself. So, yeah. like, you're talking about addiction and, and things you put in your body. Miguel and I mm-hmm. can absolutely relate to that. So, yeah. you know, it's Percocets are scary. Like, you like them immediately. Yeah. All right, so yeah. you have a quick turnaround. I, no, November 15th, Connor Shane, independent fighter. I think they had yep. problems finding you a guy to give you somebody. But, yep. Exactly. Yeah, when you're three and zero, you know, and as an amateur, um, they throw you up against in January um, against Dante Flores and Dante's opponents equaling seven and two. He is like somebody that they believe is finally going to push somebody that has had absolutely no trouble with anybody in front of them up until this point. Mm-hmm. Were you concerned going into that Dante Flores fight? No. Not at all. He was he was more of a grappler, but yeah, I mean, he was like five or six and zero, oh, something. I remember he was undefeated. Um, yeah, made my pro debut, got my first uh, TKO. Uh, so he he was trained under uh, Ryan Schultz and Ed Herman. So like oh. he's yeah, I mean he's le- like a legit legit fighter, and you know once again, Ian just dusted him like no issues whatsoever. Yeah, so uh, finished him in the first round. Um, who was it? Yeah, I mean, I just fought. I just, I was like anyone who wanted to fight me. I was like, I was taking the hard fights. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't backing down. I knew my goal, and I was like, man, if I want to be fighting the best in the world, I got to beat all the best local guys around. So I was like, bring it. And um, so I was gonna fight. Um, it was my LFA debut when I tore my knee. Um, to got the Percocet hooked on painkillers was started buying it off the streets, started going to Mexico after fights. Um, and I would buy it at the pharmacy there. Um, sorry about that guys. Um, and so I ended up getting that fight main event. Lucas Hota was his name. I ended up getting that fight main event, big fight guys, a real heavy hitter, um, did really well with the striking with him, took him down submitted him as well and um and then next i fought well it it Lucas Rota, just to kind of set the table here i mean we're, we're skipping ahead a little bit he's he's from anderson silva's muay thai from california and he's one of the instructors there so he's kind of a high-end striker and that was kind of like a test and and i mean to Ian to kind of frame it properly almost all of your fights are in colorado so, like, all of these hard fights are in front of your own people. Like, you haven't really had much time to travel and, um, you know, get outside of, of that city. Um, did you think – was that intentional on your end? Uh, no. No. It just – I sold a lot of tickets, so the promoters wanted to keep me local. Um, yeah. And yeah, you were with, so. you know, it's like you were with Sparta, you know, combat – which is a completely different promotion than the guys that run LFA. So you do your amateur career there, a couple of pro fights and you swing over with Sven Bean, obviously, and the LFA, which is another Colorado promotion. And after um, Rhoda, the LFA at LFA 22, they have a vacant title. And this is a very important part of somebody's career. You take your first loss against Marcus Perez. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I'm 8-0. I get to the fight that leads to it all, right? I, that's what I've been working for my whole – the whole journey we've been talking about. Win this fight, you go to the UFC, lose it, you're in the back of the line. I get to the <laughs> fight, and this is when I'm fighting my, my painkiller addiction. I'm battling. I'm not uh... mentally good. Um, I, so I'm literally – what I'm doing now, the last two fights, is I'm, I'm taking painkillers, you know, every other day, a few times a week. I mean, but heavy doses. And I get to this fight, and then I would quit like three weeks before. I would get sick for a week with the withdrawals, and then I would have like fight week, and then I would go fight. And then to celebrate the fight, I would take more painkillers, which I wasn't. So it was a vicious cycle that anyone who's addicted knows. 
And, um, and so I went in there, I just wasn't mentally right, rushed a bunch of stuff, just made a stupid mistake, got caught in a submission and lost my very first fight ever from my amateur to my pro career. And uh, after that, man, I, I actually I had an sit with you. I mean, it, it hit me hard. Everyone knows, Chris knows, your first loss, there's nothing like it. Um, so that hit me really hard. And I knew there was stuff I wasn't living right outside of the cage, outside of the gym. And um, so I actually had an abscess in my tooth the week before. They gave me a prescription of painkillers. And uh, I took that, flushed it down the toilet, went on this camping trip with my buddy, basically tortured myself, chopped wood till my hands bled, went on this hike that almost killed us. My buddy was... God bless him. He just stuck with me the whole time. And, uh, and my other buddy gave us his Bible study, man. And it was, uh, it was really challenging our faith. It was like basically saying we're hypocrites that we go to church, but then we live this life. And, uh, there we made the decision to fully surrender to God. And, um, it, it was such a powerful experience. He healed me of my addiction. The next week I went and got baptized. And, um, I swear when I walked in the water, it looked clear when I walked out, it looked black to me. And, uh, Ever since that day, man, I was completely sober. And at that time, I was broke, living in my buddy's basement, uh, fighting in the LFA, and uh, never paid taxes in my life. And a year after that, I was married, bought my first house, got in the UFC, broke the top 10 in the UFC. And basically, after that fight I lost, I went on a four-fight knockout streak. Equally, let, let's, let's, let's go through it. I mean, it, because nice. this, is, this yeah. is really good stuff, man. And, and, you know, in between then, you also meet Justin Gaethje, and you hook up with him. You, when you fought Tyler Vogel for World Series of Fighting when he, when he visited Denver, um, you fought Tyler Vogel. You went to your first decision, which, I mean, that's, that's pretty difficult to do, especially when you're mm -hmm. finishing guys so quick. Um, yep. Is that where you met Gaethje? Um, yeah, I mean, he fought on the same card as me and, uh, I don't know if that's where I met him. I think I've met him at Sparta events before, but, um, so that was like, you know, as a wrestler, you don't really trust your hands. You, you know, you can throw them in the gym sometimes, but there's just something about like when it's in fighting, you go to what you're best at and you're just, but I took this guy down like three times in a round and he got up every time. So I was like, okay, I got a strike. And I just threw down with him. And I really, that there was like a tipping point. And I'm sure Chris can relay. I don't know if he's seen it or if he's experienced it, where wrestlers, all of a sudden, they trust their hands compared to there's like that tipping moment where they don't quite, you can see it in guys when they're coming up, they're really good wrestlers. You're like, yeah, he's not, he doesn't trust his hands. Like he's piecing them up, but he's still shooting. Why is he doing that? You know, mm -hmm. like, he, he he's you know rocking him but then taking him down instead of just like letting his hands go and that was the moment for me when i started trusting my hands so well, you, know, you, you, you got a you got a wrestler like gaethje and, and, and it's happened to a lot of people where eventually you start really trusting your hands you're like i like yeah. this a lot better than trusting my wrestling this is a lot <laughs> funner. yes once, once you realize you got a good chin and you trust your hands the, that wrestling is just a good defense that you don't really yeah. rely on anymore. You, you almost use and it to a fault. I mean, I mean, I, that's where I was. You watch my UFC. I mean, I was a state runner up in wrestling and I never tried to take anybody down the UFC ever. I don't, I don't think really. So. Yeah, I know. And you almost need to go back to your roots, what got you there. Yeah. And that's kind of where I'm at in my career. It's like I started to get, I got one knockout and I just hunted that knockout oh. forever. And, and, but what got me that knockout was the threat of a takedown. Yeah. Exactly. You know, that, exactly. I mean, that's what made my hands good because people were so scared of the take, like boom over the top, you know. And that's the hard thing you gotta learn to mix in is is that threat of the takedown makes your hands that much better. But you have to have that threat 100%. of the takedown or your hands aren't as good. You know what I mean? So you have to have that mix. Yep. You always have to be worried about that takedown. <laughs> yep. Exactly. So 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 I and uh like for instance, uh are you are you an actual southpaw or are you like okay when you're boxing? And your power hand is always in the back. You know, your left is your jab. In wrestling, yeah. you shoot with your, your strongest hand with that leg forward. So what yeah. are you? Are you a, are you a lefty or a righty? Yeah, so that's – I'm a orthodox fighter, but I wrestle with my right leg forward. Okay, so you're, you're weird. a converted first, southpaw. I, okay. Yeah, I, I tried to be a southpaw, but it just <clears> – <throat> my left hand isn't my power hand. My right hand is. Yeah. And, so, and you have your right hand forward. 
No, What's he has his left hand forward now. Oh, you right? have your left hand yeah. forward. Okay, so you you yeah. broke an old wrestling habit then. Okay. Yeah, but when I shoot, I step my right leg forward into the shot. It's kind of like a, you know, I don't know. It's yeah, it's it's not as easy. Like uh, my buddy Chris Camozzi, he's right handed and he's a southpaw, so his hook. I think like uh, Sam Alvey, who I'm fighting, he's kind of like that too. His right, his hook yeah. is what. What's the power? So from there, um, obviously you got Lucas Froda, Marcus Perez. You take your first loss, and now you take your first plane ride because you haven't been outside of Colorado because you're such a big ticket seller. And you know you got to get look at look at it this way: when you took off and went to Europe, mm-hmm. everybody was talking about the state champion wrestler that's on the run from the law. And now you make your return and you're doing good things. You know, people like a good story. You know, they like a happy ending. So the, the, yeah. the, you're a huge ticket seller. And you take your first plane ride, LFA 31, out in Phoenix against Daniel Madrid, who is actually pretty tough himself. Yeah. What yeah, was that like jumping on an airplane for your first fight? Uh, just business as usual. I like to travel. So it was, it was cool. It was fun. It was uh, I had I had the entourage come out there, and it was it was a good time. It was one of my favorite knockouts I've ever had, so I, it was great. I mean, so at this point, are you feeling like, you know, you knew you had your opportunity uh, before that loss within the LFA? Now, you, are you feeling like, okay, I'm still on the verge. I just got to get a couple wins in a row, and you know, I'm gonna. Is that where you're thinking? Because, I mean, a lot of times you learn way more from any loss than you do from any win. If you're in a oh, different yeah. place, I'm ready to go now. Now I, now I know what I'm looking to do. Is that how this is feeling for you? Oh, yeah. So after that loss, it was I was kind of like – I was kind of like intimidated from his striking or something. I felt like I was just trying to force the grappling and end up getting caught in a submission because the guy had good mm-hmm. jits. And I was just like – I was like either I make it or I don't, but I would rather get knocked out and go out on my shield than to, um, you know, get submitted like that because I'm forcing a grappling exchange that doesn't. So I went out there just like, let's go. Like, either he's going to knock me out or I'm going to knock him out. And I ended up knocking him out. It, it, to Madrid's credit, uh, Ian is super aggressive. Like, uh, we've kind of said that a few times in this interview. He took advantage of that. Like, he saw he took advantage of Ian's over-aggressiveness and – man was very mature and just kind of counter counter countered and Ian just kind of timed his counter slowed down like his his entry and man capitalized on it like it's 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 a pretty savage knockout hey uh, Ian I, I I wanted to thank you for being very honest this whole interview I want to ask you one of those now you're going you're you're in Colorado you're back kind of like with your people where you kind of started getting in trouble and now you're on a plane in your new life to Phoenix. That's kind of closer to Mexico and the motherland. Did that ever crawl into your thinking? Uh, were you worried a little bit about maybe old connections or anything like that? Or are you free of that at this point? No, I was free of that. I mean, it felt crazy in my UFC debut when I was in Argentina. Okay. Uh, Cause that was like, I'm back in South America. I remember laying there like cutting weight and I was like, man, I'm in South America, but I'm doing it legit. Like, that's cool. Like, it was, it, that was, it's kind of been crazy. My UFC career has been like kind of like full circle in me. Like, my, my debut was in Argentina and then my next fight was in London. So, wow. Um, obviously, that fight didn't go through. Uh, Tom Breeze pulled out the day of the fight, but, um, yeah, what was the reason behind that? Uh, I think he has like mental, uh, I don't know what to call it. Uh, I don't know. He got in his car and drove away and turned his phone off. <laughs> anxiety, so, we can call it anxiety. Wow. Anxiety, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, I think he's got issues. But, I mean, everyone gets nervous on fight day, right? Like, I mean, everyone thinks, oh, man, I just can leave. You know what I'm saying? But <laughs> did I don't you get know. I don't know. Did they, I don't wanna... did they pay your just show or did they give you your win no. money too? No, they, they gave me both. That's nice. dude, That's the UFC. That's nice. Well, here, let, let's talk about your last fight on the indie grind before you go to the Dana White Contender Series. LFA 39 back in Colorado, they threw an interim title um, with Gabriel Checo. Uh, Gabriel Checo is 10 and 2, and he's actually got a win over one of Ian's teammates, Adam Stroop. Um, were you nervous going into that fight? Uh, no. 
No, I felt good. I was I was ready. Um, I was ready to reclaim that belt and and get to the big show. And um, you know, I it was cool to fight in Vail. You know, it was like what's like ten thousand feet. I was like, man, a five round fight at this high elevation. <laughs> Uh, but I got, I got it. I got the job done in the first round. I got the belt, man. That was a big accomplishment. First world title, you know, a real world, world title. And, legit uh, title. Yeah. Legit title. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was ready to make it in the UFC, but unfortunately for me, that's what the tender series is really big. And they were like, no, now you got to go win again. Cause well, usually when the, guys. Get, with Gabriel ahead. Checo, let, let's, I mean, and, and I, I, I don't mean to keep like pausing and coming back. So, Ian lands like it looks like a grazing right hand that knocks Checo down. Your footwork and like the angle change once he goes down, dude, it's it's incredible. It, it's it's highlight real material. Just the movement that you made, I, I I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't piece it together. I watched it two or three times. Yeah, um, I. I was kind of backing up and he was actually being the aggressor. He was trying to come at me really hard and I slipped and ripped. He threw a jab. I came right over the top and literally the, my top knuckle just kind of grazed the back of his head. Didn't even really feel like it. I felt like a pop, but I didn't feel like it connected good enough. But man, I looked at him, he was cross-eyed and he fell backwards. And um, I, I went at him and I knew he's really, uh, decorated off his back he's a jiu-jitsu black belt and uh, and i kind of just i grabbed his legs and kind of just stepped to the side and just did a flurry on his face dude ugly ugly like it's it's the, the way you, your movement was just so fast and the angle change uh, it was incredibly impressive and you know to sparta or that was the lfa but all yeah. the way up until this time you're fighting for like decent organizations how you had mentioned Mark Montoya was like a father figure to you. Uh, would you mind opening up about him? Like your, your feelings and thoughts about Mark as a coach? Yeah, no, I mean, he was, he was great at the time. He was the exact coach, what I needed. And um, yeah, I have nothing but good things to say about Mark. That's good. Um, and uh, you know, I wish him the best, um, uh, you know, later in my career, I just felt like it was time for, I, I was actually going to move to Thailand. And uh, that was really hard on him. And um, and I just, man, I'm, I told him, man, I'm, I'm a free spirit, man. I just don't, I was get, I was kind of, I bought a house in Colorado and I, I was kind of getting that white picket fence life. I, I had the wife, you know, and I'm married to my amazing wife. And I was just like, no, I'm not ready to settle down like that. Not, not in the way with my wife, but just like getting a house and just, I was like, let's get, and, and I went to Thailand um, after I lost to Omari Akhmedov and I just fell in love with it. And, uh, and I came back and I just wanted to move there. And um, I felt God was calling me there and he, he took it really hard. And um, obviously the Corona hit, I came back. I didn't feel welcome coming back to him and uh, we're cool to this day, but that's kind of what yeah, you got to do you. You got to do what's best yeah. for you. It's your, your yeah. fighter. I mean, you've got a shelf life. You've got to yep, make the absolutely. most amount of money possible. And I feel like it's in the, the true warrior spirit is to travel the world and fight the best people. Yeah. Yeah. So, so and I lost so, to a, go ahead. No, go ahead. What were you saying? Oh, I was just going to say, and I lost to a Russian and there was hundreds of Russians over there. So I was like, if you can't beat them, join them. And I was like, I can beat these guys, but I want to train with them. And I wrestled in Russia when I was younger and, Anyways, keep going. What were you going to say? <laughs> That's cool. That's no, super cool. I was cool. asking yeah. about, I mean, I feel like with, with the weight class you're at, usually probably a lot of those guys are going to have you a little bit taller, have a bigger reach on you. Um, you know, do you work a lot on how to work, you know, defend that, get on the inside, throw heavy punches, those over-the-top mm -hmm. kind of looping the overhand rights tend to work and, and get on the inside more? I mean, is that something you, you work out, out a lot? Or, I mean, how do you deal with the, the height advantage sometimes? Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's kind of, I mean, if you watch my fights, my right hand is, it's timing them coming in, it's slipping and ripping. And, um, uh, you know, my, my last fight, you know, unfortunately for me, uh, uh, Nazarene was really ready for the looping punches and blocking and came up with a knee right through the middle and caught me with that. Um, but I feel 
that's why I moved down here to Sanford because they have great wrestling coaches, uh, Greg Jackson and, and Kami and, uh, or Greg Jones, sorry, Greg Jones. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, real good guy. Sorry. Greg Jones. It, oh, Greg's late. real cool, yeah. man. Super yeah, cool. Greg's my guy. And, um, so just the, the, the wrestling, um, down here has just been unreal. So I just been trying to get back to my roots. Like, man, my wrestling is what set up my striking. And um, and obviously the striking down here is amazing too with Henry Hooft and Hen- Jitsu Henry's not and bad, Wagner. Yeah. yeah, he's all right. Yeah, we've heard. <laughs> and and uh, Wagner, Wagner, Wagner Rocha, yeah. and his jujitsu. So I mean, it's it's amazing down here. <laughs> Plus, the hurricane needs water, man. I love the yeah. beach. I don't like the cold weather. It's not for me. <laughs> um, and it's a free state down here, and that's what I like too. Yeah, I feel yeah. you, man. Now I, I'm uh, I'm good friends with Henry and Greg. That they uh, my buddy Mitrione used to go down there a lot, so I was always with those guys. Oh, yeah. group guys, yeah. So yep. it's amazing to me how many good gyms are right down there in Southern Florida, right there. I mean, oh, so yep. many good people. But I mean, yeah, mm-hmm. Sanford's uh, my my group of people down there. I like those guys. That's awesome. Yeah. So I, I mean, how, can we throw some names at you guys? You worked out with. We had mentioned Nate Marquardt earlier. One of Chris, your your former Pancrase buddies. Yeah. Um, can you describe exactly. your experiences working out with Nate Marquardt? Uh, yeah, it's been great, man. The guy's like an encyclopedia for MMA. Um, I've learned a lot from him, and uh, you know, he he's just uh, man, he's just good everywhere, you know. And um, yeah, it's been amazing training with him. He's been kind of a mentor to me, like and Chris Camozzi as well at a very young stages in my career, just kind of leading the way for me and just, uh, you know, helping me navigate through this MMA world. Yeah, yeah it's excellent. So, I, I, I got a question though for you. A little, I don't mean to rewind a little bit, but you said, you know, you won the comeback fights in the LFA and you're kind of expecting the UFC call and you kind of got the detour to the Dana White show. What, how did how did that work out? Did you would you get a phone call from the TV production or how'd you get that that message? So I was with uh, my old manager and I was just like, all right, like UFT contract, right? Because it was always this one more finish, one more finish, and I got that one more finish and I got it again. And it's just it was just timing of, hey, we got to go to Dana White's <laughs> contender series and make another statement, and I'm like all right, whatever, you know, and I, I thought I earned it, but I was like, you know, whatever. I feel like I took the, the hard road to get to the UFC. I feel like guys now are like five and oh, go to contender series, win the fight and they're in the UFC. And I just felt like I had to go through the, like LFA can be a dangerous promotion to be in because you're getting paid terrible, but you're getting the opportunity to fight the best guys in the world. They're <laughs> grooming you for the UFC. And, uh, and and they're they're a great promotion i love them you know and they and they know that too but and it's right they you know other promotions will pay a little better than them but they'll get you in the ufc so it's 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 high risk high reward yeah and that's what i'm saying it go ahead all their all their their is opportunity like i'm gonna we're not gonna pay you much we're gonna give you an opportunity to be seen by the ufc here you go that they're just given opportunity and Fighters love that, man. I mean, it, yep. you know if you're a real fighter and you're wanting to go places because you're fighting there. Otherwise, like you say, you might fight on a small promotion and be mm-hmm. the, make more money, but you're not really Way trying more. to make it the big show. You know what I mean? Exactly. And they and they they do a very good job of, like, kind of grooming you of, like, hey, this is the kind of interview you need to do. And, yep. like, just everything about it is kind of, like, they're, they're getting you ready for the UFC and – they're promoting you well. And, uh, yeah, they're a great promotion. I love the LFA guys. Like, they're family to me. I would love to do commentating sometime with them. Um, I love all the guys, Ron Crook and everyone. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, it exactly like you said, Chris, they, they offer you opportunity. And if you're a real fighter and if you have real goals and you're ready and you're trying to get to the UFC, you take opportunity for money because you know the money will come – when you get that opportunity. So um, you're not too concerned with it and you can, and they do really well with sponsorships too. You're on TV, you're on fight pass. Um, it used to be on access TV and uh, yeah, they're great. I mean, Mick Maynard's a part owner in it and he's a matchmaker. So, um, and the belt you get is legit. It's, it's <laughs> not easy to get. Yeah. Yeah. Well, man, 
Ian, seriously, thank you, thank you, thank you for your time, bro. Uh, hold on, I got yeah, a couple man. more questions yeah. here, man. I mean, what, what, uh, I mean, in the now, you're still fighting. I mean, what can we expect? What do you want to do right now? What do you, I mean, what, what is your game plan for the next year? I mean, trying to break yeah. in top five, get bigger fights. What do you, what's going on with you? Yeah, so, uh, you know, obviously my, my career got thrown to the wolves and uh, I, I did good and I've, I've had some setbacks too and some learning experiences. And, um, you know, recently I've been dealing with the thyroid issue. Uh, it's kind of made me gain weight, which has made my heart, uh, my weight cuts really hard and making me fatigued. And uh, I've really taken hold of my health and I've been working to heal myself. And the UFC has given me a lot of time right now and uh, to heal and, I'm fighting February 5th against Sam Alvey and who's a vet, but also a guy who's been in the game forever. And um, it's a great fight for me. And, you know, I've been fighting top 15 guys. Every, every guy I've lost to is in the top 10 or uh, except the last guy who just made it in the top 15 and looked very impressive. Um, so, you know, expect 2022, 2022 to be the year of the resurrection. Um, I'm going to be coming back strong and, um, you know, I, I, I really did a lot of praying after my last fight because I never felt so weak and terrible in a fight. And I was like, Lord, is this what you want me to do? And I felt like God was saying that um, your, your whole life has been a comeback story. Why wouldn't your career be the same? So um, I really feel like 2022 is going to be a big comeback year for me. And um, I'm doing everything I can to prepare myself. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to a big year and um, I'm excited. That's good. And that, that's the beauty of that thing in, in, in this sport I love is, uh, you know, all you can do is everything you can try to do. You know, mm-hmm. everything you put everything in, do all you can. At the end of the day, that's all you got to worry about, man. If I've done everything, I'm cool. I go into a fight with no problem. You know, if I didn't do everything I could, yeah, I'd be nervous. <laughs> so you yeah. go out there and you bust your ass, do everything you can. <laughs> Let the chip fall they may, brother. You're going to put on great fights. You know what I mean? Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Hey, I just I my last question, you know, again, thank you very much for your honesty. This whole interview, like you kind of gave us like, you know, uh, a glimpse of like your life. There's a story. Does the UFC have uh, or Endeavor, I think is the name of the company. Do they have an interest yeah. in making it into a movie? What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so um yeah, stay tuned um because they're working yeah. on something real big right now and Good. Uh, nice. I I actually have another independent offer in my email right now ready to get going and obviously, you know, uh the UFC would be the place I would like to um you know, get my movie made, but um I have some really good options out there and I think 2022 is going to be the year we solidify something and hopefully put the movie out next year. So, um well, stay tuned for that. I would Go ahead. I was going to say, just so you know, make, I make a great bad guy in a movie, dude. So just, <laughs> just throw that out there. I mean, he could be the customs yeah. agent or jail guard. I could be, I could be yeah. one of the prison guards. I don't know. I got lots of different. I could be, I think I could be white boy number one. I don't know anything. I, yeah, I, I'm I, going tomorrow to do a movie. So yeah, I, 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 I could yeah. wrap the okay. packages of coke, you know, b- before you swallow them. I'll be that guy. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I would like to play fingers if I could. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you should. <laughs> we have to get. We have to actually cut off your fingers, though. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's time I give back to this great sport. You're, you're a method actor. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, man, like they said, I really appreciate your time, dude. You had a fantastic story, and I love, you know, going through all that just to get you where you're at. Um, man, I mean, you're mentally stronger now, and just uh, I love where you're at. I can't wait to watch you fight again, my man. Thank you, thank you, Chris. Yeah, I appreciate Ian. all you guys. No one likes somebody that just gets everything handed to them. That, that's, no one can relate to that. You know, you've had to work your entire life and you've put yourself behind obstacles that are insurmountable and you've always conquered them. Like, dude, we need a happy ending, bro. We, we need that UFC belt wrapped around your waist. We well, need that, man. Hey, hey, man. Just, I'm hey, doing dude. everything I can. Yeah, to be honest, it's already a happy ending because just to get out of the system and progress into like a normal life, just that is a victory, right? With a passport. Just keep you know, keep still. Keep them rolling. Keep them rolling. That's all you got to do. And and you're in a good spot because, like Chris said, you you know, I don't know why we always believe that you you can win or lose a fight with your mind before you get in the ring. And 
you know, yep. your your mind has been battle tested since you were a kid, man. So yeah, yep, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no, look for look. I'm going. I'm either gonna come back with my shield or on it this next fight. So um, that's hey. what makes exciting fights, and I'm going hard and I'm giving it everything I got. And I'm, I, you know, I pray to God He gives me that blessing and. You know, getting that belt would be the stamp on the whole career and my whole journey. Um, you know, but I'm gonna stay humble and, and be grateful for whatever God gives me. Hey man, if there's ever anything I can do for you, let me know, man. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it, bro. All Being right, a fan you of your good career, one. man. You're a legend. Hey, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Whew. Wow, man. That uh <laughs> Mike, that did not disappoint. You know, you, no. you did your detective work. I didn't know enough about that guy. I don't know how I didn't hear that before, but uh Man, that first half an hour, I was just, uh, I was kind of mesmerized. But I got, I'm not gonna lie, I just, I was, <laughs> I'm waiting for the movie to be made. Well, you know, Chris, I'd like to say he held back, or maybe he was kind of like, you know, lying about certain things. <laughs> no, no, that was that was brutally honest. <laughs> that, yeah, he didn't. And the funny thing is, he does, he didn't even act like he wanted to not tell anything. I mean, it was just, and I even love like he'd be like. Uh, were you nervous for this fight? No, no. <laughs> he never said he was. Nah, oh, oh, not only, at all. When, only when fingers stopped backing him up was he nervous. That's the only <laughs> yeah, time so, I noticed he might be uptight a little bit. Yeah, Good I gotta boy. get out of here. I'm gonna die tomorrow morning. At 6 <laughs> That's always bad. It's, you yeah. know, I tell you, it's uh, there's gonna be a movie made. And you hope it's going to be a happy ending. But here, let's talk about, you know, fantastic story. Let's talk about some of the concerns. This guy does all that time in the feds, bouncing around all of Europe, gets his hand raised in his first fight. And, you, you know, was that a relief? No. I think it wasn't enough. You know, like but, someone like that, you got to have like a, like a governor to kind of, when you're at 100 miles an hour, kind of knock you back down to 95. You know, you know what I think could be could be very helpful for, for him is, you know, after just winning a fight or even a title, can that even get that adrenaline up as high as it's been before when people are trying to kill you in prison? You know what I mean? Like, eh, I've already been through tougher. I've already been through worse. Win or lose or draw or whatever, you're like, you've already experienced a more intense thing than that. How, how, yeah. how can you compete with that? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And, Chris, are you nervous about this fight? I don't know. Have you ever been to the X-ray while mewling cocaine through your system and yes. and beating the test? No, 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 I haven't. <laughs> hey, you know what? Even no matter what happens in this fight, I'm probably not gonna die. So it's all right. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, share, wow. subscribe. Like, share, subscribe. Please, if you're listening to this right now, you owe us one. You owe it to us. And we got a promo code. Bet DSI.eu. You throw in 500, you throw in 1,000, you get 50% of the money you put in towards oh. your, your bets uh, as long as you use the promo code lights out. Um, bet DSI.eu, promo code lights out. And if you're getting a phone call from us to do an interview, the gauntlet has been thrown down. Top of your and, and I can tell you something. Tell We're you. about to release a list of the people that said they do the interview. We do the research on, and then they just kind of Ah, uh, give me another day. Give me another day. This is a warning to those fighters to pick up the friggin' phone. <laughs> I got that out. I feel better. I feel there better we, go. we want you to feel, feel good. All right, guys. That's Ian Heinrich in the can. See you next Monday with a new interview. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.